Fun fact, my very first ever machined customer parts came out of this very bar of material. It has followed me around in my stock supply for years. It's been to three different houses. It's been through three different moves. I should have thrown this away a long time ago, but today it's the day. I made that first batch of parts on my old CNC router. It was a Millwright CNC router. I was Millwright's seventh customer. I'll see if I can throw in some, some B-roll and I'll see if I can find pictures of the parts. They went terribly. The parts were awful. I don't remember if I ended up charging the customer or not. I kind of think I just went, nah, I can't do it. Uh, they were so bad. Hope. <laughs> Hopefully we can redeem this bar today, seven years later. Now, coming out of this bar should be 120 parts. The parts are these little cylinders. They kind of look like they have a Phillips head on the side of them, though it's not actually a Phillips head. I can't show you the details of that slot on the side, but you can see some kind of general overviews of the cylinder itself. We will be getting 36 of these parts off of here at a time, at least the first operation. First operation is just to make a cylinder. Second operation, we'll add the Phillips head thing. But we'll do 36 at a time and then we'll tab them off with a slitting saw. That should be relatively time efficient and not a terrible way of making cylinders. I am definitely worried about this material being just like stringy and having a lot of burrs and being ugly. I don't really want to hand deburr 120 of these things. And I don't want to add a third operation to deburr the other side of the cylinder. I would like to keep this a two operation process if I can, since there's 120 of these. Which by the way, 120 pieces is my largest job to date. In terms of number of pieces, not in terms of money, this job is actually on the smaller end for me because these parts are so simple. Our cam here is really simple. If we pretend this is our cylinder, we're gonna start by facing off the top. Then we're gonna come in with a boring operation to clean up the sides. And lastly, we're gonna come in with a slitting saw and part them off from underneath. We may need to play with that slitting saw operation because as it's cammed now, I'm pretty sure that these are just gonna go flying around the machine and I don't really want to go hunting through my chip pan for them. Sometimes you get lucky and they stay connected by a burr and so that's what we're gonna hope for. If hope fails us, then we'll start playing around with tabs or something. I always use my table saw to cut plastic materials whereas I use my band saw only for metal materials. That is to avoid contamination of the plastics. We don't want chips to be like shoved in here and end up finding their way into one of my parts. My setup for this op one is about as simple as it gets. Just using this little self-centering vise with the material sticking straight up out of it. This little self, this little import vise has really good teeth. It's really aggressive at grabbing into and digging into the material. And so it is perfect for plastic parts like this. Well, I suppose that was predictable. Uh, it is very fuzzy and we've lost about a third of them. The ones that are left are not usable due to fuzziness. Let's see how well this block comes off. That's not bad. Okay, that's decent. Yeah, these are not pretty though. Here, we'll put them under the microscope. They're looking Kind of like that. They've got a big fluffy head. The walls are terrible. There's a lot wrong with these. Dimensionally, those are actually in spec. They were a little bit too thick, but within the tolerance range I was given, the diameter was pretty much dead on, except the finishes were ugly. So there is hope. I have a couple things I'm gonna try. I should probably do these one at a time to isolate the variables. 
but, but our goal here isn't science. Our goal here is to get parts made. So one, I'm going to switch to a new tool. Two, I'm going to play with some speeds and feeds. And three, I'm going to add a deburring operation to the top of the cylinder. I was hoping that I would just get lucky and there would be no burrs, but that's not happening in this material. So let's make those changes and see what the new results are. Okay, we had some wins on that one. We made progress. There are a lot fewer fuzzies, and if we pull the parts out, they're looking relatively clean. The downside is they're also looking relatively sparse. Our recovery rate isn't looking so good. We got 10 out of what was it, like 36 that we were cutting at one time? So a little over a 25% recovery rate? That's not gonna do. So my proposed solution to this problem is tape. I'm gonna have it contour the sides and then pause. Then I'll put a layer of tape over the top of it and then we will cut off the bottom. Hopefully the tape keeps them from escaping. UHMW is notorious for nothing sticking to it. So hopefully the tape stays on. Maybe we just go straight to hot glue. Well, they're all still here. That's a good sign. I'm not sure if I'm gonna be able to get them out one-handed, but they will hopefully come off the glue easy enough. Yeah, there we go, it's off the glue. Hard to see, but it's off the glue. What if I try some isopropyl alcohol as a release agent? This normally helps get rid of glue and it shouldn't affect UHMW at all. Now, if we peel off the glue, <laughs> I like how I can tear them off and I get this like magazine of, of parts. The glue doesn't seem to be leaving any sticky residue on the parts. And so I think, I think we found a winner here, guys. This works really well. I might also put them in a bowl of the IPA and hopefully that will help release them a little bit easier. But I think we got 100% recovery on this batch. All right, for the rest of the night, I am just gonna go, where am I? There I am. For the rest of the night, I'm just gonna go into production mode and listen to music and watch YouTube videos and have fun. And I will see you guys in the morning when I'm ready to move on to op two. A confession guys I am starting to feel stressed last time I worked on this I was able to get a ton of these op ones made I don't know how many I made I didn't count I just figured I would make too many and that way I would have enough but I need to do the op twos now and as I'm looking at my schedule I'm realizing that I have a lot to do I have some parts due next week out of these giant pieces of stainless they are the biggest, most complex parts that I've ever made. I only need to make two of them. I have three blanks. These parts are, these two parts alone are going to account for the equivalent of about two weeks of revenue for me. And I gave myself a week to work on them. Or when I scheduled it, I gave myself a week. But then I had something come up and something else come up. And now I'm traveling for six days next week. The week that I was supposed to work on those. So. That gives me about three days after I get back from all of the travel to get them done. And I don't know if that's enough time. So I need to knock out these plastic parts like right now so that I can start on those complicated parts and get a head start for when I get back from all of this travel that I'm working on. I don't know if it's just me. It's never like making the parts that's the stressful part. It's always the stuff around the work that adds stress to my life either money or other obligations. 
or uh, ordering materials or materials not coming on time. Like the manufacturing part, the milling part is definitely the easiest part of my job. Anyway, time for OP2. There's two vices that I tend to use for OP2s. I have this vise, which is a Far East Asian import that allows you to put soft jaws on it, a lot like that self-centering vise you see me use for OP1s. It's just designed for soft jaws too. And then I also have my flux vise. I tend to use the import one on relatively low precision stuff. And I use the flux vise for higher precision stuff. The flux vise is just nicer. The only problem with it is the soft jaws are more expensive. I make my own soft jaws for this thing and I can get like eight parts out of them. It works out to be like a dollar of soft jaws per part. Whereas on this thing, it ends up being like $13 per job out of soft jaws. Neither of which are that big of deals, but it's just kind of easier to make them my This is my OP2 fixture. It's basically just a row of 10 rectangles inside the flux vise here. And that should position these little cylinders relatively accurately. One of the nice things about these parts is nothing is clocked. Like at this point, they are just cylinders. So it doesn't matter how they go in here, just as long as they fit. This is definitely going to be a little bit of a tedious task though. Do they fit? Oh my gosh, they're so small. Someone remind me to buy tweezers. That job is all packed up and ready to go. I'm gonna go drop it off at FedEx and that will officially be the earliest I have shipped a job since doing this stuff full time. Uh, it is almost two weeks early. Now, granted, most of my jobs don't even have two weeks of lead time, but it's good to be making some forward progress. I've put some processes and just like general administrative stuff in place and it is really helping me out as a business and as an individual.